So, um, you know, since it, it says 7.39 now, let's, let's try to begin this in earnest. So uh, just to test out your chat function, I just wanna see that the chat is working for everyone. Um, if it's working for you, can you please type in one to indicate yes? If it's not working, can you type in two to indicate no? Great, I see some ones coming in. So I'm gonna trust that, you know, we, that we're all on the same page and we can hear, uh, we can all hear me clearly. All right, so let's get to it. Now, I'm hoping to finish this webinar in 60 minutes. I'm hoping for this to be an hour long. I understand that, you know, you all have lives as well and I don't wanna to take too much of your time. Uh, however, uh, you know, it's probably a good idea to be prepared for a little bit more time. Uh, it is possible that towards the end of the session, you may have some questions as well. So we could get some of those out of the way, provided we have time. But uh, ideally, we'd like to be done in an hour if possible. Uh, I did see that somebody put in, the, you know, the raise, like hit the raise hand uh, button. Just, uh, you know, reconfirming it in case you weren't there at the start. Uh, the raise hand function just doesn't really work very well for the purposes of this webinar. You're better off typing something on the chat or typing something in the Q&A bar. Uh, now, a few ground rules for this session, you know, so that we can conduct it in the most efficient way possible. We, we obviously want to have an ideal level of organization so that, uh, you know, everything goes off without a hitch. Now, uh, if I ask you any questions, I would like you to type in on the chat window. If you have any questions of me, you can put it on the chat window, but I would generally recommend or prefer that it uh, gets put on the Q&A tab. If you find that you're facing a lag and you aren't able to hear what I'm saying, um, ping me on the chat window, right? Hit me up on the window and uh, we can then see if everyone is facing a problem or not. So I'll then just ask everyone if they're dealing with the same issue as well. And if multiple people are dealing with the same issue, if many of the people are dealing with the same issue, uh, it's probably something that I need to work out on my end. If not, the problem is probably on your end. So I would recommend, you know, maybe restarting your connection or reconnecting to the webinar to get things set up. All right, so a quick introduction, right? So uh, my name is Matu. Right, you may have seen me in class or you may be hearing me for the first time. Um, I have a master's in economics from the University of Amsterdam. And incidentally, I had to take the GRE to get into that program. So, uh, you know, not that long ago, right? Less than five years ago, uh, my GRE score is still valid. Uh, so less than five years ago, I took the test as well and uh, you know, I had a similar experience that all of you are going through right now of, of trying to prepare for the GRE and take it on. Uh, I did pretty well on the test and I like standardized testing. So this is something that, uh, you know, I always felt like I was comfortable with and I got a 336. Um, and, you know, I was all set to join the corporate world, get the traditional kinds of jobs that you would get after studying economics or business. But, you know, I realized that I, I didn't want to do any of that. Not that, that that's a, a, a bad thing, but uh, I didn't really want to do any of that. And uh, what I really enjoy is teaching. What I really, you know, think is fun, what I really get up for in the morning um, is to teach. So uh, I think that, you know, ultimately when it comes to taking on any test, there's a couple of things that you have to set in place. The first thing is that you need to understand the challenge itself. You need to know what you're up against. And the second is that you have to start by believing that you can beat this as well. Um, if you start thinking that the GRE is an impossible challenge, it would be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, I see that somebody says that they're having a net problem. If you are also having a problem with the, uh, you know, with, um, Hearing me, can you press one? If you don't have any problem and everything is fine, please type in two.
All right. Uh, I see a bunch of twos coming in. So I think that, uh, you know, there's one other person who's hit a one. So I think that, you know, if you're, if you're struggling with the internet, it's probably a good idea on your part to, you know, refresh the connection. Cause I think it's working fine for pretty much everyone else. Um, all right. So yeah, getting back into things, right? So, you know, I think that you need to know what the challenge is and you need to start by believing that you can beat it. If, if you don't believe that you can beat it to start with, then you don't really have any chance whatsoever. So always start with a positive attitude. Uh, I usually coach for the GMAT and the GRE. And when I'm not doing either of these things, uh, I generally, you know, follow a lot of cricket and football. And I'm very interested in history, philosophy, politics, and, you know, the intersection of all of these fields and how they impact our lives. So enough about me now. And let's move on to a little bit about uh, crack verbal you know, as an institution, as a company. And, you know, essentially what it is that, you know, we sort of specialize in and what we pride ourselves in doing is that we act as mentors throughout the entire master's process. So, uh, you know, very often the test prep industry, you know, says is, is all about, okay, I'm going to help you prepare for a test. And then that's that, uh, you know, we'd like to say that, uh, our position is a little bit different. Uh, taking on a master's is a very, very big decision. Uh, you're planning, you know, especially if you're planning to move country, especially if you're planning to, you know, change the foundations of how you live all together. So, you know, we'd like to say that um, we help you through this entire process, right? It, it's not just about taking the exam itself. It's also about sending in your application essays. It's also about, you know, um, having a sense of where you can apply based on the kind of score that you have and what are, what your life will look like, you know, when you take on, when you start your life, you know, in, in this new environment. So, uh, you know, all of these are important parts of the process and, uh, you know, we sort of assist with the entire process from start to finish. Uh, I see that somebody has, uh, you know, raised their hand. I just, you know, want to reiterate that uh, raising your, the raise hand function just simply does not work effectively on our end. You know, in that there's no possible way that I can really respond to you. I, I think that you're best off putting a, com uh, putting a comment in on the chat or, um, you know, answering, uh, sorry, putting in a question on the Q&A tab. All right. Um, now, with that being said, you know, there, there are a few free resources that I would like to draw your attention to, you know, a few things that you can check out with before you get started. So if you hit us up at online.crackverbal slash GRE, um, you know, you, um, you will have certain access to, you know, what our course is like, and you'll get a sense of what the process is like, what we intend to teach you and how you can best learn what you need for the test. Uh, in addition to this, we also have certain eBooks, certain, you know, other free material that you can access uh, to give you a sense of, you know, what the MI, what, you know, it is to, to apply for a master's in science, what it is to, you know, prepare for vocab, uh, what it is to, you know, sort of help you prepare for the verbal section that tends to be, uh, you know, um, a genuine challenge, right, in itself. So, you know, a bunch of free resources on this front. And, you know, best of all, like I know that this is how I, I react to things and that, uh, you know, I don't have the best concentration span. I don't have the best attention span. So, you know, videos are always helpful for that. You know, it's something that you can always have on in the background while you pick up information. And it also allows you to pause when you need to. So, you know, all of those are the obvious advantages of having access to videos. Um, a couple of other things, we also have these flashcards that are, you know, very um, carefully designed with the intent to help you actually learn words rather than simply being any other word list. And, and this is something that I will get into uh, in a bit more depth in today's session as we move along. Uh, finally, we also have these blogs, right? So we publish blogs, uh, you know, on, on a sort of semi-regular basis to give you a sense of, you know, a bunch of the peripheral details around, uh, you know, learn like preparing for the GRE and preparing for your masters. Uh, too often, it is very easy to get caught up with, uh, you know, just focusing on um, 
the exam itself and the challenges of the of the exam and the exam is just one part of it it's it's an important part but uh, it's just one part so so that's something that we do need to you know look at every now and then and we have the resources uh, there for you all right so having gotten all of all of that out of the way let's get to it by the way you know uh, i've sort of structured this uh, webinar into three parts and uh, how I think would be most efficient for us to go through this is that whenever you do have a question, you can put the question in, but I'm not going to answer it right away. Uh, at the end of each one of the three sections, I'll pause and take all of the questions that have come up until this point, provided I didn't you know, already answer it in the intervening period. Uh, another thing that I'd like to you know, put forward is that it's probably a good idea to keep your questions related to the content and the topic and the ideas that we're going to be discussing in this webinar. Uh, if it is something that is slightly out of the way, I may be able to assist you, but it's not necessary that I might have the right information or the time on hand, you know, given the limited amount of time and the fact that this is not just yours and my time, but everybody, you know, in this session's time. So with that in mind, let's get started. Let's just dive in. Now, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to open up uh, a poll. So if you hit the polling tab, you'll find that there is, uh, you know, the three polls and the, and poll number one is titled hardest thing about the GRE. And, and you, you know, it's a question with four options. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch the poll. It says, what is the thing you find hardest in the GRE? And you have a few options, right? Vocab, reading, quant concepts, the test setup, and you know, I'd like for you to, uh, you know, answer the questions, uh, answer the question as quickly as you can. I see that there are, uh, you know, 21 respondents at the moment, other than myself. So uh, let's wait until we have about, so either until a minute is done or until about 80% of the people at least have responded. This way, we, you know, have enough of a sample size to have a meaningful discussion around it. All right, 20 seconds to go. Keep sending your results and keep, keep answering the question as much as you can. All right, great. So incidentally, we did get about 80% of results in already. So I'm gonna end the poll right here. I think that makes the results available to everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, as I see, as it, it looks as follows. Uh, more than half of you, in fact, almost two thirds of you, right, of, of the people who voted have said that vocab is the biggest problem. And I do see some people who have trouble with the test setup itself, a little bit of trouble with reading. Uh, one person is a bit concerned about quant. Now, to be fair, uh, the way that this is set up is such that, you know, well, this was a session about vocab. If you've signed in, of course, you're interested in, in learning about vocab. Of course, that's, you know, your primary concern. And, you know, that makes sense. We, we've asked other people as well what they think the biggest challenges are. And these tend to be the top three challenges. And that's exactly what we've seen in today's poll, in the poll that we have over here. The biggest challenge is vocab, followed by reading and followed by the test itself, you know, and the way that the test is set up. Uh, now... Reading on the GRE, of course, is its own challenge. It, and, and it's difficult and it's a challenge because we tend to read the way that we've read all our lives and reading for the GRE is a very specific skill. So that is something that you would have to look into. And that is something that when you get into your prep is worth trying to study and worth trying to learn on its own terms. And of course, we have techniques to help teach that. Um, when it comes to the test itself, yes, the test is long. It, it's challenging in terms of, you know, time crunch. And there's other aspects to the test that, you know, we don't really spend too much time thinking about, but they still sometimes tend to have an impact, like the AWA. Uh, all of this is challenging, right? But, but it's stuff that we can get around. Uh, incidentally, I do see a question that's come in about, you know, the, the pattern of the questions. So uh, I can only really give you a very, you know, basic sense of this because, uh, you know, it could take a, a while otherwise to get into. But, um, you know, something that I could tell you on this front is that uh, ultimately you get either, uh, you know, two sections of verbal, two sections of quant, and you get another section that can be verbal or quant. So you have, you could have three verbal and two quant or two verbal and three quant. 
That, that just depends on your luck. That just depends on the setup of the test. And within a verbal section, about half the questions are based on filling in a blank or rather picking the most appropriate word for a blank. And the other half of the questions tend to be about reading comprehension. A single section has 20 questions, so it's kind of like a 10-10 split. Uh, lastly, the AWA stands for the Analytical Writing Assessment. Um, in its simplest terms, you could call this an essay section, right? So there's, uh, you know, you write two essays over the course of an hour. And, you know, that really is the challenge of the AWA. But it is separate. It's scored separately. And it doesn't impact your verbal score out of 170. So that's not really something that we need to worry about too much as an individual concept or as an individual challenge. But as we said, really, the biggest challenge is vocab. And what is difficult about vocab, right? What tends to be the, the biggest problem with vocab? Really, it's, you know, three situations that I hear being described on a regular basis. One, I have no clue what the words are, right? What do some of these words even mean, right? They, they make no sense. I've never seen them before. Uh, and, you know, what do I, like, what does, say, the word obsequious mean, right? Like, what, what is that? I've never seen that before. How do I deal with that? Right? And that's understandable. The next problem is that, you know, I've seen this word while prepping. I vaguely remember, I, I learned this word while I was trying to learn difficult words, but I don't remember it now. And you know what, I hear this question way too often. And, and it's kind of sad because, you know, if you don't know what the word is, you don't know what the word is. But if you study the word but don't remember it, that's a waste of effort, right? You put in time and effort and, and struggle to learn that word, but now that it actually has come up and you have the good fortune that that word came up on the test, but you don't remember it. So that really, really sucks. And, and that's something that, you know, is kind of sad. So, so we want to figure out how to deal with that, right? We want to figure out how to make sure that doesn't really happen as much. Lastly, I've seen this word, but it's been used differently here. You know, it doesn't, I, I remember the dictionary definition sort of, but it doesn't match what exactly I'm looking for. And, you know, that's, that too is kind of a sad problem because again, it means you put in the effort. It means that you have, uh, you know, really studied, you've put in the effort, you've, you've, you've struggled to learn these words and they've come up and you've had the good fortune that, you know, you happen to study a word and it came up. There's, there's often, you know, so many situations where you learn many, many words and not many of them, you know, really turn up as easy words, you know, as, as words that you would straight up remember. But all of that's happened and it's still the thing that's caught you out of context. So really, here's the thing, right? Words are completely unknown. Well, you do have to do some study by yourself. But when it comes to the next two problems, these are things that can be solved if we have a better technique. So, our, so if we have a, an easier technique by which we learn words, right? So that we actually remember them. That's something that we got to look at. And the next thing is that when we learn words, we can't just be learning words for the sake of learning words. We have to have a sense of a connect of why we're learning these words. We need to have a sense of context where we might use these words. Otherwise, what's the point? Right? You could learn all the words you want, but if you don't know where to use them, it's not going to help that you learned any words for the types of questions on the GR. So really then, why is vocab difficult? What is the challenge with vocab anyway? Right? What is it that makes vocab very hard? Uh, in order to understand this, what we need to first understand is why vocab is even important. Why is something, why is vocab something that's tested, right? Um, you know, we ask students what they're studying. So many, so many people who uh, study in India and then look to do a master's in other parts of the world are generally looking to study STEM fields, right? They're looking to study uh, science or technology, uh, engineering, mathematics, fields that are not the kinds that you would associate with having great language abilities, great faculty over, you know, the English language. So why does it then matter that these people know vocab? Why is, why is the GRE testing whether these people know vocab? Why do universities even care that these people have done well on the GRE, a test that tests you on vocab? Now, here's the thing. When you go to grad school, you're going to be doing a lot of research. Ultimately, when you go to grad school, whether you do a research master's or a top master's, you're going to have to write a thesis, right? No matter what. And when you write a thesis, this involves a lot of research. This involves uh, a lot of writing as well. And you need to be able to understand the context of what you read. And you need to be able to use very precise words to communicate exactly what it is that you want to communicate, right? 
these big words aren't just there to be big and to be you know intimidating these big words are there to be precise to communicate a message that will uh, you know clearly put forward the idea it is that you want to put forward and this means two things one you can't really write more words than you need to otherwise it gets winding it gets long it gets boring and you can't really miscommunicate either you have to pick the right word so you want to do something in a manner that has precision and concision, right? It's concise and, it's, and it gets to the point and is accurate as well and is correct as well. So let's take a look at an example of this. You could say, I found a 500 rupee note on the ground by luck that takes the form of finding valuable or pleasant things that are not looked for. Or I could say, I found a 500 rupee note on the ground by serendipity. Okay, fine. Now, that's, that's nice, right? You've said something that was precise, right? You've used fewer words and serendipity, you know, sort of accurately conveys whatever's been discussed here. But you know what? You could say, hey, Matu, you set this up, right? This is, this is not a good example. You, you absolutely set this up, right? You've just defined serendipity, luck that takes the form of finding valuable or pleasant things not looked for. That sounds like a definition to me and you've just put that in, right? And you're right, I have put that in. But the point still stands. Right? You could say, why don't you just say I found a 500 rupee note on the ground by luck? That works too, right? And it sort of does, but not exactly. If you say I found a 500 rupee note on the ground by luck, that could really mean one of two things. It could mean that you found a 500 rupee note on the ground. Like, you know, you dropped your 500 rupee note, you went looking for it. It was a windy day, but you know, you got lucky, you happened to find it. Good, by luck. It could also be that you just found a 500 rupee note. You found somebody else's 500 rupee note. You weren't looking for it, right? You just, it just happened upon you. Now, the first case and the second case can both be described as luck. But serendipity is only used for the second case. So if you were hoping to find this thing and you got lucky that you found it, that's not serendipity. You weren't looking for it and you found it. That's what serendipity really is. So, what this means is that by choosing to use this more complex word, you have communicated a more precise meaning. You have communicated something that was more specific, that was more detailed, and you have inadvertently, you have, you know, by doing this, you have given me a better understanding of the situation that you just described, right? Now I know that you have, uh, that, you know, it wasn't just a regular kind of luck, it was something that happened totally unexpected. So this is why vocab matters, right? At the end of the day, you are going to be doing some research and you do need to have the words at your disposal in order to communicate your ideas effectively, right? Now, this is one thing, but at the same time, I don't want you to think that this means that, uh, you know, ultimately that you're just trying to toss in big words or that big words are always better, or that big words always work in the way that they need to, right? And this tweet is a perfect example of it, right? Because it's so ridiculous. Let's go through it, right? It's from the UP Tourism, right? And um, it says that the unbeaten, sagacious astuteness of Varanasi is no less than a figurine of rectitude for the people. And honestly, I'm sitting here thinking, what the hell does this mean? I've used this slide before, I've gone through this before, and I still don't have a clue as to what this means, right? What, like, I mean, I could get at what some of these words are, right? So sagacious, right? Sagacious would be what to do with being a sage, right? So it would be an adjective associated with being a sage, a sage would be sagacious. So what do we generally associate with being a sage? I guess being wise and being silent at the same time, being wise and being calm at the same time. And that's what it is to be sagacious, you know, to have this wise and calm demeanor. Uh, but how does that apply to this sentence? Same with astuteness, right? Somebody who is astute is somebody who is intelligent as well as perceptive, as well as somebody who has good perception, who's able to observe things effectively. That would be an astute person, right? Somebody with intelligence and perception. Again, right? But how the hell is that related to this sentence? How the hell is that related to what they're trying to tell me? Right. I know because it's UP tourism that they're trying to tell me to come to Varanasi, but I don't know how they're explaining this through this. Right. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever from this kind of sentence is no less than a figurine. A figurine is a literal figure. I, I think they meant a, a metaphorical one, but a figurine is like an idol. It's like a literal figure. Right. So 
that's something to look at, right? And rectitude, okay, I guess figurine of rectitude, what does that mean? Something that, an idol that helps you stand straight? That, that sounds terrible. That sounds like a crucifix almost. That's, that's terrible. But okay, fine. Um, you know, like, like, like I, I don't want to go to, to Varanasi after seeing this. And I've been to Varanasi. It's, it's so much better than is described in this tweet. Right? And it gets worse. There's a picture that says, seizure the quietude engraved in the transcendent aura of Varanasi. Yeah. Seizure is, is so different. I'm sure they meant you want to seize the quietude or you want to seize the calmness. But a seizure is, is negative. A seizure is when your body completely flips out because it's been triggered by light or by some other issue. That's, that's absolutely ridiculous and it doesn't help at all. So really, this is why vocab matters, right? You're not, you're not just trying to use big words. You're not just trying to have a sense of what these words are. You're trying to use, big, you're trying to use the right word for the right context. And this is what the GRE tests you on as well. They're not just testing you on, you know, using words for the sake of it. They want you to have a sense of context. And for this, let's take a look at a sample question. All right. So this is a sample sentence equivalence question. This is one of the types of questions that you'll see on the GRE. And um, it's one of the types of questions that makes up half the test in that you're looking to put, you're looking to fill a word or multiple words within a blank. That makes up about half of all of the verbal questions that you'll get. So let's take a look at this one. Most young children are often blank to old stories. All right. Now, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to see some answers in the chat, right? So could you tell me what you think the answers to this question might be? By the way, just letting you know, um, for sentence equivalence questions, there are two correct answers and you have to find both of them. So that means that, you know, it could be that A and B are correct. It could be that B and D are correct. It could be that C and F are correct. It could be any combination like this, but okay. Most young children are, are often blank to old stories. So how could they react to old stories? Could young children be indifferent to old stories? Sure. They could not care, right? To be indifferent to something is to not really care too much about it. That works. Could most young children be empathetic to old stories? They absolutely can. They absolutely could feel, uh, you know, like they empathize with or that they relate to the old story. So that, that could be an answer as well. Most young children are often impertinent to old stories. Okay, now to be impertinent is to react negatively towards something, is to react in a misbehaving manner. Uh, you could say that, uh, you know, puppies are often impertinent in their behavior, uh, you know, because they refuse to, you know, stay calm or they're always excited to meet you more so than is necessary. Um, right. And that, that doesn't really work here. They, they're not talking about a reaction. They're talking about the description of something. So grammatically, you know, let's say that we can probably get rid of the word impertinent. All right. So that's that. Let's put that one. Let's take that one out of the way. Okay. Sympathetic. Most young children are sympathetic to old stories. They could be sympathetic. Uh, right? They could care. They could relate. Apathetic. Now, if you're apathetic, it means you can't relate at all. And most young children could be apathetic to old stories as well, right? That could work too. Most young children are resistant to old stories, which means that they don't want to hear them. They're, they're resisting them. They're pushing them back. And, you know, that could work as well. If, if they don't like the stories, they could be resistant to them. So really going through the options, you know, we could only say that it's not impertinent. It could be any of the other combinations of two options. And I see the answers that have come in and two people have said indifferent and apathetic. Indifferent and apathetic kind of work, I guess, right? I mean, sure. But what about empathetic and sympathetic? Most young children are often empathetic to old stories. They're often sympathetic to old stories. Uh, you know what, like that could work too, right? Uh, this would depend on your knowledge of young children or your time spent with young children. And that automatically makes this question weak because the young children in one place could be very different to the young children in another place. Or the young children you have met could be very different to the young children I've met. Right? Somebody who has said indifferent and apathetic, that could be their experience. I have also taught young kids and they like hearing whatever stories I have to say, you know, whatever stories I have to tell them. So, you know, I might say empathetic and sympathetic, right? Why not? So the good news here is this. This is not exactly a GRE question, right? I've manipulated it somewhat. This is not what a GRE question looks like and you will not see a GRE question like this. It's been manipulated slightly. So I'm gonna show you now what the full question looks like. 
most young children are often blank to old stories as they are unable to relate to the characters and lifestyles of olden times, right? So now we have a little bit more of a sense of what's going on. Most young children are often blank to old stories, right? Okay, they could be anything to world's old stories. They could be indifferent or they could be empathetic. But now we have some context. Now we have a clue as they are unable to relate to the characters and lifestyles of olden times. All right, and now what do we say? We can say that they're unable to relate, so that would make them indifferent, right? They, they don't care because they're not able to relate. They are apathetic, right? They, they, they don't have any reaction or feeling towards these stories because they're not able to relate. That makes sense, right? And you know what? Because of this clue, we can now say that A and E are definitively the right answers. The question could have gone, most young children are often blank to old stories because they have few opportunities to hear stories otherwise. And then you could say that they're empathetic and sympathetic, right? Which are a bit more positive, which show that they'd be reacting in a positive manner. But the clue here, the context given to us here tells us that the right answer should be A and E. And indeed, the right answers here are A and E. They are indifferent and apathetic. Now, what was the purpose of this exercise? The purpose of this exercise was really to outline two things to you, right? The first one of them is that you will always get a clue somewhere else in the sentence. The sentence cannot be based, or solving this question rather, cannot be based on your experience with young children, right? If, if, if it were based on that, then you could get wildly different answers and they could all have a claim to being correct but there has to be an objectively correct set of answers. So that can only be done if there is a clue given to you somewhere in the sentence and that clue gives you a sense of the context that you need to follow, right? So that's one thing. The second thing that comes out of this is that it gives you a sense of what kinds of words you need to learn in the first place. So, you know, what happens is that we get told, hey, you know what, I need to learn like a thousand words, I need to learn like 3000 words, I need to learn like 5000 words, and, you know, all of that is kind of irrelevant if you don't think about what kinds of words do you need to learn? What is an important word to learn and what is not an important word to learn? At the end of the day, if you have 10 questions like this, you have 60 words that you're going to be tested on, right? 60, 60 words or so. Let's even say that there are two, two words in each question that are confusing, though I don't think that there are any in this particular one. But let's imagine that that's the case for a second. So that's eight words per question you're going to be tested on like 80 words. And yet we feel like, hey, I need to learn a thousand words. I need to learn 1500. We're doing that to hope that what, like 0.1% of words work, right? We're doing that, sorry, that, that, that's not right. 1500, let's say a couple of thousand words for 80. So 2000 for eight. We're doing it to hope that 4% of words actually show up. 4% is tiny, right? We're putting in all that effort for such a small payoff, but you know what? It's worth it, right? It's worth it. I'm not saying don't do it. It's absolutely worth it to do it. And it absolutely is important to do it. So what we really need to then think of is not the usual questions of how many words do I need to learn? What kind of list do I need to follow? Oh, you know, how am I going to like, you know, try and just memorize words off the list. All of these questions themselves are fundamentally not the right way to think about approaching the test are fundamentally not the right way to think about approaching work. Right. And that's what we really need to get at. That's what we really need to understand to start with that. It's not a matter of saying, Hey, I'm going to give you a thousand words, memorize these thousand words, and you're going to be good for the test. No, you have to have an understanding of what you can be tested on. So given that we know that there's some context here, what is it that we're really going to be tested on? Right. What is it that really is going to be the challenge? I want to show you another example, which will help demonstrate this more clearly. Look at the words firm, obstinate, and pig-headed, right? And the factual meaning of all of these is the same. It's somebody who is not prone to changing their decision, is not prone, you know, kind of is set in their ways and, you know, knows what they're doing, right? Now, and is fixed with what they're doing. Now, factually, yes, they mean the same thing, but you would never use these words all in the same context, right? Let's see how these words work in context. John is firm with his finances. He never spends more than he makes in any given month. And that works because the word firm, it has, you know, either a positive connotation or it could also have a neutral connotation, but it's generally one of the two. John is firm with his finances. Great. 
John is obstinate with his money. He doesn't want to contribute to his colleague's birthday fund. So now, you know, it's the same thing. John is set in his ways. John is doing what he knows to, like, you know, what he knows that he's good at or what he knows that he wants to do. But this is now a little bit more negative, right? It, you know, it, it's suggesting that maybe he should contribute to his colleague's birthday fund and he's being obstinate by not doing so. He's being, you know, he's being kind, kind of a bad person for not doing so. And lastly, we could take the word pig-headed, which is also negative and is much more extremely negative than is the word obstinate. So, you know, we could see this sentence here, which says, John is pig-headed with fiscal matters, right? Fiscal matters are financial matters, matters associated with money. John is pig-headed with fiscal matters. He refuses to take his family on vacations on the pretext of saving. Now, John just sounds like a dick. Right, he, he doesn't want to take his family to places. He doesn't want to, right, do like he doesn't want to, you know, uh, have a little bit of fun just because he says, well, no, I got to save money. I'm not, never going to spend anything any more than I make in a certain month. The saving is just to be put aside, right? Now, John, John, John sounds like a douchebag, right? I, I don't want to be friends with John. So all of these words technically meant the same thing, but they were meant to create different ideas, different connotations. So what this means is that it's not really enough to memorize, just memorize words, right? You can't just say, I'm gonna take a look at a list and memorize a bunch of words. You need to understand the contextual meaning of these words. So really, what is it that the GRE is gonna test you on, right? Let's understand some parameters for what is going to be tested. What we can already sense is that what is gonna be tested is something for which there is context. There must be context for the blank provided within the question. How do we know that children were indifferent and not empathetic? We know this because there was context provided to us, which told us that they are unable to relate to the characters and lifestyles. Without that information, we'd not really know how to approach this, right? So there has to be context provided within the question itself. There has to be something that will give you a descriptor for what the blank is somewhere else in the question. So this means two things. The blank has to be describing a thing that has already been described elsewhere, right? So they're unable to relate. What could that be described as? That could be described as being apathetic. So the description has already been given somewhere else to you. You're just putting in a description that matches that. So it's going to be describing a thing that has been described elsewhere. The other thing that it could be is describing an action done by, done by someone or something that has also been given context elsewhere in the sentence. You know, you could say that, uh, let's say the word is, um, you know, uh, jumped, all right? So you could say that, uh, you know, Oscar Pistorius blanked into the sand um, and covered more ground and achieved more height than he had done before. Now that tells us that whatever is the, the action has been described to us, the action has we've been given some context for what the action is. So therefore we could say that, hey, the word is probably jumped. Now that's of course a very simple example, but essentially we're describing some action that already has context or it's describing a thing that has already been described elsewhere. That's really all it can be. So what you're really looking for, that means, right? And what you really want to start by targeting, right? When we say we want to learn so many words, what kinds of words do you want to learn? You want to learn uncommon adjectives, right? So adjectives that, you know, uh, that are, you know, descriptors of words that are just not words that you would have otherwise heard very often, right? So adjectives or verbs that generally have a very clear positive or negative connotation. And I would apply this to adjectives as well. The reason for very clear positive or negative connotation is this. The context that you get, that you get will often be positive or negative. So that means that, you know, if you get a very positive context, you know that you want to put in a very positive word. We saw that children are unable to relate to characters and lifestyles. That's kind of negative. So we were looking for adjectives that were kind of negative. We were looking for indifferent and apathetic, which worked because they were kind of negative and they matched the tone of what we were looking for. Now, I'm not saying that these are the only types of words that can be tested and everything is just categories A and B. However, this is a very big part of the words that can be tested. And, and, and what this means is that you're not just looking to learn words in bulk. You have to have an approach. You have to have a clear sense of, hey, I'm looking to understand different adjectives. I'm looking to know what are different positive adjectives. I'm looking to know what are different negative verbs, right? And when you get a sense of that, you can properly take on the challenge that you have in place.
So how do we approach vocab anyway? At this point, I'm going to take uh, you know, a very quick break, or not really a break, really a, a break from the presentation, but I will answer the questions that have come in. All right. So somebody's asked about how much vocabulary is it you know, necessary to remember. And as I said, right, you know, you could learn 30,000 words and that may not be enough. And you could learn 500 words and they could be enough, right? There's no fixed amount. What you really have to think of is what kinds of words are you learning, right? And ultimately, this is best done not with a list. In fact, lists are quite problematic and that's something that we will get into down the line. Uh, what's an easy way to remember vocab? So what we're going to look at uh, down the line as well are, you know, techniques and approaches in order to learn words that make words a little bit, uh, you know, easier to remember, make words, give your words a sense of context, right? Um, at the end of the day, right, having the sense of context is essential because of two reasons. One, okay, it'll help you answer the questions, right? But two, it's easier to remember a word if you actually have context for it. If you just memorize the words, I guarantee you, you'll not remember them. Right? I want to see if there are any other questions that have come in. Uh, well, this is interesting, although it's a little bit, um, a little bit off topic. Somebody asked why I studied in Amsterdam, uh, you know, because there are good universities in the US and UK. And the US and UK are very expensive countries that uh, you know, kind of, in my opinion, at least go out of their way to make you feel unwelcome. Uh, by the general approach towards, you know, how their societies are geared. Um, in addition to this, yeah, I, I, think I would say that money is probably the biggest motivator, but uh, my sister also is currently doing a bachelor's in Amsterdam. And, uh, you know, I thought it would be nice if I could be close to family as well. So uh, many reasons into, you know, as to why I might, you might choose a place outside of the US and UK. And, you know, hopefully that gives you a little bit of, uh, you know, food for thought on the fact that uh, you could take the GRE to go to many places all around the world and your options need not be, you know, supremely limited. Um, all right, I do see somebody else asking me how long I prepared for the GRE. That's, uh, that's a rather complicated question because uh, prior to doing the GRE, so a year before the, I did the GRE, I did the CAT and I did uh, six months of prep for that. Um, and the cat is a slightly different beast. So I then had to come back and do the GRE, but some of the contents, I already like the verbal section. So I, you know, the verbal section is more different. And uh, so that I think means that you probably would have to put in a bit more effort, but I like the verbal section. So it was not as much of an effort for me. I think it was just coming back to the quant concepts and ideas that I wanted to refresh myself on. So, you know, for the GRE specifically, I prepared for a month um, for, uh, but, you know, I did six months of prep for the cat before. So, you know, really, I would say that it probably may take you, you know, a couple of months at least. And if you really are serious about learning vocab, I would recommend even say about three months of prep for vocab. You can get to the other stuff later and learn it a little bit quicker, but definitely lay the ground for vocab, you know, if you can, three months in advance. Uh, somebody's also asked for the links to the vocab flashcards. Um, Yes, I will actually, there is a Dropbox link and you know, here's, here's the Dropbox link. Uh, so I know that that's not super helpful, but you know, if you, have, um, if you have the print screen function or if you're using a Mac and you know how to screenshot with uh, command shift and F4, you can just go ahead and do that and maybe, you know, type it out later. I know that's not ideal. I know that, that, that actually, you know what, that, that is not ideal at all. Uh, feel kind of bad even for suggesting that. So you know what I'm going to do? I realize that I can just copy this over here and put it on the chat. How about that? That, that makes things a little bit easier. All right. So let's move on now, uh, you know, to the next part, right? Of, you know, what really is the challenge? So now we, we know why vocab is important. We know why vocab is kind of challenging or rather what it is that they're testing you on. So this helps us understand what exactly we need to do, right? Like, so that we know, okay, what do we need to do? How do we need to take this on, right? Um, and in order to get at that, right, I'm gonna ask you another poll right now. So um, let's see if we can open this polling. Uh, can we open poll number two? All right. So uh, check out poll number two. It's a, you know, it's titled prize fighting. 
And the question essentially goes, you have a bout, so a boxing bout, a boxing fight or a match, uh, scheduled with Floyd Mayweather. And, uh, you know, for some context on this, Floyd Mayweather has a 51 wins, zero loss record. He's totally undefeated. He's considered uh, by many to be the best boxer in the world. And you have to fight him in three months. So how are you going to deal with this? How are you going to, you know, figure out how to deal with fighting Floyd Mayweather? So I've opened up the poll and there's really three options, right? So one is to curl up in a ball and give up. Two is to train 25-8 uh -huh, uh, and become a better, you know, become better than he is somehow. And lastly, you know, try to learn how, you know, what his weaknesses are so that you can exploit them effectively. Once again, I'm going to keep the poll open until about a minute or so or until 80% of people answer. All right, I see that the minute's up and, you know, this, I, I do admit that this is somewhat more of a joke poll just to get you, you know, lead you into the direction that I wanted you to, to come to. And, uh, you know, essentially, yes, all of you who have answered have answered, uh, you know, that you're looking to learn his weaknesses. Now, that's good. That's good that we're all on the same page because at the end of the day, here's the thing, right? You could answer, you could look to like, you know, train an incredible amount. You could look to, um, you know, uh, you could look to really, really push yourself in all ways possible, but you need to have a life of some kind, right? You need to be doing other things other than simply doing the GRE all day. And you know what? I've asked this question before. Somebody else has pointed this out. Yes, I've asked this question before and it is kind of rigged in order to get the result, uh, you know, that I want out of it. And, and you know what? What I really want you to understand and take away from this is like, yes, you may have picked the option as well, but I want you to be convinced of this yourself as well. That, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to become good at the GRE by understanding the GRE. You're going to be good at the GRE by knowing your enemy, by knowing what the GRE wants to toss at you, and therefore knowing how you're going to take it on. Right? So we have to outline the challenge in very specific terms, outline that we need to be able to handle A, B, and C, and then come up with techniques in order to deal with A, B, and C. And that ultimately will be the most effective way to prepare for the GRE, a most effective way to, you know, really learn vocab for the GRE. So how is it then that we need to approach vocab? Now, the first big mistake that people make is that they take, that they make word lists, right? And you know what, I've already been asked questions here, right? Can you provide a word list? You know, can you suggest what are good word lists, right? And you know what, I don't like answering that question because fundamentally my answer to you would be don't use a word list, right? Because Word lists are fundamentally broken, right? Word lists have uh, a, a baseline technical flaw within them. And here's what the flaw is, right? So, so I've, I've clipped, you know, a list of words from another source that, you know, obviously a competitor, so I can't name them. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've clipped, clipped a, a, a list of words from a different source. And, and as you can see, you know, you have the word censure, chicanery, connoisseur, discordant. Great. Those are all, you know, pretty challenging words. You may know what some of them mean, but may not necessarily. And you have the definitions for them. To criticize severely or to officially rebuke. That's what it means to censure someone. Right? Chicanery is trickery or subterfuge. Sure. Right? Uh, connoisseur. A connoisseur is somebody who is an expert on something or somebody who is like an, you know, who is good at uh, rating whether something is good or not. So you'd, a wine connoisseur would be somebody who is an expert in telling you what wines are good and not good. Uh, something as discordant would be conflicting, you know, which sounds off, right? Discordant would be a conflicting sound over anything else, something that sounds very off. You might say that, um, you know, uh, certain forms of electronic dance music in the early part of this decade, I don't know if I sound old for, for uh, you know, suggesting... <laughs> Uh, for talking about pop culture from the start of the decade. But, uh, you know, there was the EDM music from, from like 2010, 2011. A lot of it was focused on creating a drop, creating sounds that you wouldn't expect to hear together, creating discordant sounds, 
which were deliberately designed to sound harsh so that it would have you know an effect on on you of you know creating a certain kind of energy so that could be discord now all right great so you you can memorize these words but the problem is that you know just me describing these words to you has already given you more context than trying to learn them in the manner that it's that has been presented here there are three big problems right one the words are in alphabetical order your only relationship to the word chicanery is that it's next to the words connoisseur and censure that that doesn't happen that that's not helpful right they're not related in any way i remember that as a kid i learned um, i learned a lot of countries right so I, I learned about where you know the countries were and all that other stuff right as uh, you know kids often like kids are interested in this kind of stuff too and you know when i was like um, i think three or four years old I, I i like you know i can't say i made the decision but my parents right pushing me or whatever but uh, my parents pushed me to learn you know like all of the countries of europe right or all of the countries of say the former soviet union um i learned all of that alphabetically and then i had to do a lot of unlearning to have a sense of well where in the world are these countries you know at the end of the day uh, a country like kazakhstan or turkmenistan right once that i'm using as examples because they're fairly close to india they're a bit north of pakistan right so you know all the stan countries kind of close together right um that's in asia and you know so that's that's kazakhstan right now at the same time you know after kazakhstan comes latvia Okay, well, that's not actually right. Okay, so after Kazakhstan comes Kyrgyzstan, another one of the Stan countries, and after that comes Latvia, right? Um, Latvia is on the other part of the world. Latvia is uh, neighboring all of the Central European countries. They are poles apart, but I'd learn them together because I learned them in alphabetical order, and that was a big mistake because I understood nothing about where these countries were or anything useful about them, right? So ultimately, you do not want to learn words. in alphabetical order right that doesn't help you and most word lists are organized like that the next problem is that you only get a superficial knowledge about what these words mean right okay you know that uh, chicanery is trickery or subterfuge but like what kind of trickery uh, trickery or subterfuge are we talking about would we say that uh, you know that that uh, you know uh, that your mother was doing some kind of chicanery when uh, you know she'd uh, make your food morsels sound like an airplane to feed you or would you say that hitler performed all kinds of chicanery to uh, you know make other other countries think that he was not about to start a world war right two very different situations in terms of intensity how could we say which one is chicanery and which one's not you don't really have full knowledge on what the word means the final problem is a lack of context right so there is no sense of uh, you know what the connotations of the words are right like what what the intensity of the word is uh, you know how we might say it and when we say register like where might we commonly use it what is the effect that this word might have right and ultimately these problems make word lists fundamentally flawed so if there is one thing that we need to know is that we shouldn't really be looking to use word lists we need to find an alternative pattern The next challenge is that our own brain gets in the way. Our own brain introduces certain roadblocks, you know. And and what happens is this, you know, our brain craves novelty, right? It, it uh, and the reason for this is that you know we we have spent most of our history as a species as hunter gatherers. Uh, all of the stuff that happened has happened in recorded history is a very small part of history. So our brain still works. you know on the basis of being a hunter gatherer which means living in a new place every other week finding new berries and things to eat living a life in which there constantly is novelty so what happens is that our brain doesn't really save the boring stuff you know because the boring stuff doesn't really make it past the filter of this is important and life threatening right you see a tiger come into the room and you're like hey this is obviously very important i need to you know uh, have all of my mental faculties to escape this tiger but you know to learn to read a long list of pages of you know words or how to build words that's not really as interesting right so you need to overcome that roadblock so one we need to have a technique of learning words that doesn't involve word lists two we need to overcome the roadblock of you know fighting the challenge in our own head and three you know the the other challenge is that uh 
when you learn the words, there should be a sense of connection within them, right? That you're not just learning words for the sake of learning words. You're learning words to actually be able to do something with them. It cannot feel disorganized or disconnected when you pick up these words. So really three challenges, right? We, these are the three things that we need to do. These are the three things that if we learn how to overcome them, we should be fine. And the good news is that none of these challenges are really insurmountable, right? They're not challenges that we cannot get past. They're not challenges that we can't overcome. Something that's insurmountable is something that cannot be overcome, right? So we can overcome these challenges. All we need to do is we need to have a technique. We need to have a plan which makes sure that, first of all, we need to know what the scale of the task is, right? What are, like, what, what do we, what, how many words do we need to learn? What kinds of words do we need to learn? What is the GRE trying to test, right? We need to know what we're up against. We need to know and plan what our task is. The second thing is that we need to use tools that actually work, right? So not using word lists. We need to build rather, instead of saying a list of connections, let's talk about a web of connections. A web is much nicer because every link in the web is connected to all of the other links. And that's the way that our brain actually learns. That's the way that the neurons in our brain work. They make connections with each other and you wanna make as many connections as possible to build the word, set of words that you know. So rather than looking by, looking at a list, looking through, you know, learning things in a very uh, rote memorization style. We want to build a web of connections. That's the second challenge. The third challenge is that we need to have a sense of optimism. We need to have a sense of reward, a sense of progress, a sense of, uh, you know, we need to feel like we're actually gaining something because our brain is constantly telling us this is not important. So how do we overcome that? We overcome that by saying, okay, you know, important or not important is one thing, but we're making progress. We are different today than we were yesterday. So that clearly means that something has changed in our life. And that gives us the motivation, that gives us the impetus, that gives us the drive to continue on and to get better. So let's discuss what this approach has to be. Uh, but before we do that, let's you know, go through the questions that have been asked. So tips for everyday study for the verbal section. Uh, I would say, first of all, that vocab is probably something that you wanna spend about half an hour a day doing. Uh, beyond that, I would say that there's really only two things that you can, you can do. One is learning the conceptual matter around a type of question. Two is practicing such questions to get better. Uh, ultimately, you know, I would say that, you know, you build your study plan based on your strengths and weaknesses, right? I would not say that there is a one size fits all study plan. Ultimately, if you find that say sentence equivalence, you know, the type of question we looked at is kind of hard for you. You want to spend more time on that. If you find that reading comprehension is a challenge and this is easy, then you want to spend more time on reading comprehension. That's really what you want to do. Uh, somebody else has asked, uh, you know, or no, actually the same person has asked, um, is, uh, you know, what, uh, what without a word list, what would be a better way? And that's what we're going to discuss, right? We know now that we're looking to get a web of words and we're going to discuss a few techniques that would help with that. Um, Another question that's come up is how did I cope with the RCs? Uh, honestly, when it comes to coping with the RCs, what, what helped was that uh, I spaced them out. You know, if two RCs came back to back, I'd tell myself, no, I'm not gonna do this RC just yet. I'll move ahead to some SE and TC questions, you know, the sentence equivalence types of questions. And I solved those questions first, then came back to the RCs. Ultimately, the important thing to remember with an RC is that you don't need to understand everything that the RC is talking about, right? The goal is not for you to understand how ancient Romans, uh, you, know, um, you know, how they treated literacy and how they approached literacy when it came to lawmaking. What you're trying to understand is how can I use the content of a passage in order to answer questions? So that's really what you're looking for. Another question saying that for practice, do we have any website? Well, I would recommend for you to join us, right? Uh, we have, an, we have you know, a list of questions. We have a question bank. We have an approach to you know, the concepts that you will need to learn as well. So on that front, I would you know, thoroughly recommend our services as the way to go. I also see some questions that have come in the Q&A tab, so that's nice. Uh, could you send this webinar to my email? Okay, so we can't really send the webinar to your email because, uh, you know, it's one that just gets published on YouTube. So what will happen on the other hand though, is that, uh, you know, it'll be published on YouTube on our channel. You can check it out over there and that would be a good way to look at it. 
Another one is how many words should we learn? Like I said, right, there's no fixed number of words. Uh, ultimately, what you need to think about is this, right, that when you start learning words, if you're learning the right kinds of words, you'll make the most progress to start with, right? As you go up, you're going to, the, the, the number of words that you learn will have less and less of an impact. At a certain point, you're just going to learn words that aren't going to be asked or aren't going to be useful because at the end of the day, you aren't going to get more than 100, you know, even moderately complex words on the GRE as a whole. So that being said, right, what you, what you really need then is what you, is an approach rather than a number, right? Uh, let's see if there are a couple more questions, right? So tips for RC. I can't really discuss tips for RC here. You know, like I said, right, the main thing that you wanna take away is that you don't need to know everything about the passage. You don't need to know about the content of the passage. You just need to know how to answer questions. I think that's, uh, it's more of a philosophy than a tip, but that's all I really have time for at this point. We're already running past time, so you know, I'd like to get into the approaches to take, right? And yeah, somebody's asked about the technique. That's what we're going to look at moving forward. Now, I do want to, you know, put in another poll, right? So let's uh, move into poll number three. And it just says, would you rather, right? And it's a simple question. Which of these things would you rather do? Would you rather write the GRE or would you rather play games with some close friends? Right? Again, you have a minute to answer the questions. Go ahead and put in your responses. All right, I see that less than half of you have voted at this point. Yeah, yeah, C come on in, send, send in some votes so that, you know, we at least have something to analyze. Although I do see that the results are coming in um, in rather an unexpected fashion. So that's, that's interesting. That's, that's something that we can look at as well. All right, so now that we're through with a minute, I'm going to end the poll and you know, make, make the results available. Uh, now, you know, most of you said that you'd rather write the GRE than play some games with your friends. And I find that incredibly weird. And you know what, like as a, fa as a faculty, which is something that, you know, I should never do. I'm gonna take this opportunity to call you all out on being massive nerds. But you know what, because I would much rather, like I would rather not do the GRE. If I didn't have to do the GRE, I wouldn't be doing the GRE, right? I would rather spend all of my time having fun or doing other stuff that's fun. And you know what, uh, what tends to happen is this, right? I, I understand why the answers have come out the way that they have. Uh, you know, you feel like I need to do the thing that is, you know, give the right answer or give the answer that's the, you know, expected answer to give in, right? Um, but really, you know what, let's, let's be honest for a second, right? Um, ultimately, you want to, you want to do something that is fun, right? And, and, and when, you, when you, like the reason that, you, that games are fun or the reason that games are enjoyable is that they give you that constant sense of reward. So that's something that we're going to come back to. All right, now, how do we deal with proper planning, right? Firstly, impossible to know all of the words. You have to learn smart, right? What this means is that you have to make the conscious decision to learn at least some words every day. Even if you just spend 20 minutes a day learning words, even if you just say, I'm going to learn words for 10 words in a day, right? That doesn't take too long, right? You're going to make some progress, but you have to make that con conscious decision to do this. The next thing, right, and this will help you memorize words a little bit more easily, is that you need to group your words. Don't just learn random words. Don't learn chicanery and then connoisseur, right, just because they happen to be next to each other alphabetically. Right? It doesn't really make sense to just learn random words. Group your words together, then you will have a better, you will be able to remember them better because you will be learning words together that you would use together or that you would use in a similar situation. Ultimately, the first 800 to 1000 words you learn will give you the biggest leap forward. The next thousand words that you learn will not give you as much of an advantage. This is true because this is true for language itself. Right? You could probably say that you have a recognition vocabulary of about, you know, say three to 5,000 words, and that would be being fluent in English, right? That would be being extremely fluent in English. Um, 
But there are people who have 30,000 knowledges of 30,000 words as well. There are people who know like 100,000 words. Uh, if you are an artist or, you know, if you're an author or you're a, a rap artist, you probably know 150,000 different words. Now, that doesn't make a big difference though. And that certainly doesn't change things, right? It's not like rappers do better on the GRE. And that's not just because the GRE is an inherently racist exam, but uh, that's also because of other, other factors, right? It's also because the words that they're learning may not necessarily, may be disjointed or may not be the right words. So ultimately you always, always, always want to try to group your words together and make sure that that grouping will help you, right? So learn firm, obstinate, big-headed all together, and that'll make a lot of sense, right? Whenever you come across a word, another thing that you should do, aside from just memorizing the word, is also write down whether this word is positive, neutral, or negative. We saw why this is useful, right? You're often going to get asked something for which you're given context, and part of that context is the tone in which the author is speaking. Part of that context is whether it is a good thing or a bad thing that is happening. And therefore, if you know the tone of this complicated word, you would have a better sense of where you might actually use this word, right? Another thing that you want to look at is, you know, like the manners of grouping words is something that should, you know, be linked by a single united context, right? Um, a good example of this is Harry Potter. All right. Now, if you're not familiar with Harry Potter, this may not entirely make sense to you. So I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, in the Harry Potter series, there's uh, a teacher named Remus Lupin. And, uh, you know, you find out uh, at the end of one of the books that Remus Lupin uh, actually is also a werewolf, right? I hope I haven't spoiled anything for you. It's been long enough at this point. If you haven't seen it or you haven't read the books, that's on you. But okay, Remus Lupin turned out to be a werewolf. Now, I read this book when I was eight and it shocked me. I was like, Oh my God, Remus Lupin was a werewolf. I, I did not see that coming. That was incredible. How did they even, you know, put that through, right? How did JK Rowling think about this? And you know, how did she blindside me in this manner? But you know what, now that I know a little bit more about words, I'm like, okay, Remus Lupin is kind of a silly name. How did I not see this beforehand? How did I not already know that this guy was going to be a werewolf? And there's two reasons why. The word Lupin comes from the Latin root lupine, all right? Now, when something is canine, it's to do with dogs. When something is feline, it's to do with cats. When something is lupine, it's to do with wolves. So that's one clue telling me that this guy has some wolf stuff going on, right? The other clue is also the word Remus. Now, in Roman history and mythology, uh, the story goes that the city of Rome was founded by two brothers, Romulus and Remus. Now, what is special about Romulus and Remus? Uh, what's special about them is that they were raised by a wolf. So Remus would, was somebody who founded the city of Rome, but was raised by a wolf. Now, if you give somebody the name Remus Lupin, it even jumps out that this person is going to be a werewolf. I can see this coming from a mile away. So there's all other kinds of words on this front from the Harry Potter series as well. You know, something that is incendiary is something that is associated with catching fire. So I'm not surprised now that the spell incendio is something that, you know, is used to set things on fire. So all of these words now are words that I have a singular context for. I have the Harry Potter context for this. So I would learn all of these words with, in, together as part of a group. Here are some examples of groups that you can use, right? Words from mythology. The GRE loves asking words that have their origins in mythology, particularly Greek and Roman mythology. Um, you know, so if, you, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, if you play God of War, or you know, if you play, uh, you know, if you uh, listen to certain kinds of metal music, you will come across these words. You will come across some of these ideas. So bring them all together. Words from a certain genre of books, right? If it's high fantasy or if it's science fiction or if it's, uh, you know, even nonfiction, right? Books about economics, books about running a business, right? You're going to get a bunch of words all in that context. And since that context is the same for you, when you memorize words from these parts, uh, from these sources, you're going to be better at memorizing them, them than you would be from memorizing words from a list. And other examples of groupings that could be useful. Words that you've learned from video games. Video games often give you stats. They'll tell you things like strength, perception, agility, right? Um, 
Now, okay, some of those are pretty obvious today, right? But when I was a kid and when I was like five years old and playing my first role-playing game, that was nuts to me, right? Oh, what is perception? I'm being told that perception is the ability to notice and observe things better. Great, I had no idea what that was when I was five and now I do, right? Um, so, you know, words that you get from different sources are all going to help because they provide you the context. Another set of things that you could do would be, uh, you know, put together words that have a similar meaning but different connotations, right? So for example, like being firm or being pig-headed, similar meanings, right? But the connotations are very different. Or words with extreme connotations, right? Words which, uh, you know, like words that, um, you know, like for example, a profligate is somebody who spends money recklessly, right? Now, that's a very extreme word. You would not use that in most situations. You would use that, only in an extremely negative scenario. So if you call somebody a profligate, that's straight up an insult. Now, knowing that is helpful because you know now that, hey, okay, that could be, if I see the word profligate among the options, what I have to see is, well, is the context here very negative, right? And if it's not, great, I can eliminate it. If it is, that's even better. That's a good chance that that could be my word, right? So learning to group words in these kinds of categories will certainly help you picking up words more effectively. Now, the next thing is this, right? How are you going to get context, right? We, we've come up with, you know, sort of three-pronged approach to help you build context, right? And what, let's come back to what the philosophy is. What we want to do is build a web of connections. We don't just want to learn words as a list. We want to make connections between the words that we learn so that when we learn a new word, it's backed up by the words that we already know. It's, we're like, yeah, okay, that's the situation in which I might use it. Or if it's not backed up by the words you already know, you at least have an external sense of context, right? I would describe somebody as a profligate if they, uh, you know, maxed out their credit card and then made a credit card in their dog's name and then maxed that out as well and then made a credit card in their dead grandparent's name and then maxed that out as well. It's only in that circumstance that I would describe somebody as a profligate. And now that you have that context, now that you have, you know, this description of when you might call someone a profligate, you now have a better sense of what that word might mean, right? So ultimately, there's three techniques that we have. One is mnemonic devices, one is word roots, and the last is to exploit the interest that you already have. And we've touched upon all of these three, but let's get into them in a little bit more detail. Now, the first is, how do you gain context with mnemonic devices? Ultimately, you can gain context with mnemonic devices uh, because what you're doing is, the visual clue is providing you with a context that goes beyond just reading the word. A visual clue, you know, you read the word, you read the word, but a visual clue helps it stick in your mind. Now remember, we saw the word chicanery earlier, which meant trickery or deception. Now you have an actual situation attached to it, right? You have this person who has bought coffee, but it turns out that it's not actually coffee, it's chicory, which is like the drying agent that's put with the coffee, but uh, you know, it actually contributes to the weight as well. So, you know, ultimately it means that you've gotten less coffee. And she's complaining and saying, hey, this is not coffee, it's all chicory. You've, you've cheated me here. You've done some trickery, you've done some deception. And that action that has happened here is chicanery on the part of the salesperson, right? And something you could look at, that, that, that uh, context that has been provided to you in addition to the word. Same goes with the word lassitude, as we can see over here, right? Uh, lassitude can be described as lethargy or sluggishness, but you instead have, you know, what looks like a post-IPL Harbhajan Singh chilling out, right? So, you know, this post-lunch lassi attitude, right? Like the, the way that you feel when you have a lassi after lunch and you just want to chill out, that is that, that description, that mood, that, that idea has been captured by this picture. And that means that you'll learn this word more effectively. Now, the good news is that such words are provided to you as part of the flashcards, right? To which I've provided the Dropbox link. So let's take a look at an example of such a word. The word is condone. Now, what does it mean to condone something? It means to excuse or make allowances for or to be specifically lenient. So to condone something is to allow something, but in a situation where you otherwise would not have allowed this thing. So, you know, you have this judge saying, I forgive your, your crimes, you're free to go. This person still did crimes. The judge is saying, hey, look, it's okay that you did the crimes. It's all right, you're free to go. So the judge pardoned the con who had done bad things. 
you have a visual clue, you have a kind of, you know, a auditory clue in how the sentence sounds. And that together helps you get a sense of what the word condone means. Right? If you want to check out more such flashcards, they're present in the link that I've given. Now I'm going to take a short, uh, you know, um, a short break to see the questions that have come through. Right. If you don't mind, can you share your vocab list? I do not have a vocab list. I, like I said, I don't use a list. I think it's a bad idea to have a list. Right. I didn't make a list myself. Right. Uh, although I would recommend it's a good idea taking down notes. But even when I did it myself, I didn't really, uh, you know, go out of my way to make or use a list. Right. Ultimately, in fact, the whole point of this webinar is to drive you away from the idea of making a list altogether, since lists are fundamentally ineffective. Your, uh, if you use somebody else's list, the worst part is that somebody else has found the context. You have not found any context, right? When you learn the word yourself, when you go through the journey yourself, you go through the effort of taking the context yourself. So that's why I would say that lists, probably not a great idea. All right, the next technique that would help you learn words is through word roots, right? And, or through etymology, which is the study of how words develop. Now, Word roots, I would say, is the hands down most effective strategy. There is nothing better than learning word roots, right? And here's why, right? It's, it's good for three reasons. One, a single root can teach you multiple words. So you have one word root, but there are many words in the modern day, in modern day English that come from that word root. So, you know, you end up learning words so much quicker, right? The next thing is this, that the words that you learn will inevitably link. You have already had, you already get the context while learning these words. Because when they come from the same root, they're talking about the same idea. They're talking about the same emotion. They're talking about the same mood, right? So you get a sense of context automatically. The third part is that you get partial knowledge of more words still. So, you know, you might see, okay, so through word roots, you learn what some words are. There'll be other words as well that you don't know exactly what they are, but you see a root that you recognize and you could say, hey, this word is something to do with sleeping. This word has something to do with praying. This word has something to do with, uh, you know, uh, height, right? This has something to do with, you know, materials inside the earth, right? This has something to do with the general idea. And that in itself is a clue, right? You may not know what all of the words are. And in fact, I would say that, uh, you know, you won't know what all of the words are on the GRE. You won't have a sense of what all of the words are. Right. So uh, ultimately, um, what you need then is that partial knowledge. That partial knowledge is going to be a big boon. I can tell you this. Right. I got a 166 on the verbal section. That means I got some questions wrong, but that means there were still more questions that, uh, you know, I didn't know the answer to it. But, uh, you know, for some of them, I was able to make educated guesses. How could I make educated guesses? That's because I had partial knowledge of some words. And that comes from learning words through word roots. So let's take a look at some examples of this in play. If you take a look at the word cred, all right? So cred is Latin for belief, all right? And now this has sparked a lot of words that we use in modern day English. When we say credit, right? When you buy something on credit, you buy something with the belief that the, that the or rather the bank believes that you're going to pay it back. That's what it means when you get something on credit. When you give credit to someone, you're saying that you believe that they are the ones who put in the effort or did the work. When we say that something is credible, we're saying that it's believable. When we're saying that something is credulous, we're saying that it's believable. But when we say something that's incredible or incredulous, we're saying that it's unbelievable. More so, the word incredible is generally positive, right? We could say that, um, you know, that I had an incredible performance on the GRE and that would generally say that you've had a positive performance. But when something is incredulous, it means it's generally negative and it's saying that we don't believe that this has happened. You know, I find it incredulous that uh, that, uh, you know, when when, uh, you know, Donald Trump says that uh, racism is no longer a problem in America. Right? I don't believe it. You could also say a credo. A credo is, you know, a set of beliefs. A credo is, um, you know, a set of beliefs that that unite a group of people. And the people who are united by these group of beliefs are united by a creed. You may know the game Assassin's Creed, which has also been turned into a movie, right? The creed is called a creed because they are a group of people united in their belief. 
So that's, that's something that gives you a sense of how that word came to be as well. So that's six new words, right? Seven new words that come together just by learning cred, right? For belief. Let's take a look at a couple of other words along this line, right? So let's say pathos. Now, if we look at the question earlier, we, we saw, you know, sympathy, empathy, apathy, right? Right, all of those were words and you may know what some of them were and some weren't, but here's a sense of where they come from. There's the word pathos, which means pain in, in Greek and, that, and it has originated a lot of words in English, right? Sympathy, technically the, the dictionary, well, not the dictionary definition, but the origin would be that you are able to relate to somebody else's, somebody else's pain. Empathy, you are able to literally feel somebody else's pain. Apathy, you are not able to relate to somebody else's pain at all. Pathology, right? So the pathology is the study of how pain impacts us, right? So it's the study, it's knowledge, right? About how pain uh, Im Im impacts us. Something that is pathetic, right? Is something that is sad and weak that arouses a sense of pain within us. We feel pain for it and we feel pity for it, right? So that would be something that is pathetic. Right, so that's, that's a whole bunch of words from pathos. We also now have a bunch of words from culp. Now, you know, you may know that mea culpa in Latin means my fault. And you may have noticed that there's a theme here, right? Words from Latin and Greek tend to provide a lot of the more complex words in English today. Um, but yeah, mea culpa means I'm sorry in Latin. And literally translated, that means my fault. So culpa was, you know, is to do with fault or blame, culp, fault or blame. So when we say somebody is the culprit, that is the person who is at fault. That is the person who is to be blamed. When we say that somebody is culpable for something, it means that they're responsible. It means that the blame lies with them for something. Now, what about inculpate and exculpate? Okay, that's interesting. Right? Those are slightly more complicated words, right? Certainly words that you may not have seen before. But we can now make a guess as to what these words might mean. We know there is something to do with fault or blame because it has culp. The other thing that we might be able to guess at is that they have the prefixes in and ex. Now this probably suggests to us that these are opposites, right? If it's inculpate, exculpate, they would be opposites. So in, what is in used for? You know, in, right? And ex is usually used to say out, right? Something that is external is something that comes from outside. So to inculpate somebody is to blame them. It's to bring them into the realm, into the zone of being blamed. To exculpate somebody is to exonerate them, is to absolve them, is to say that they are not at fault. You are excluding them from being blamed, right? And that would be to exculpate somebody. So as you can see with your knowledge of word roots or through word roots, if you look to learn new words by picking up the roots, Right? Or if you say, hey, this is one interesting word, you look it up on Google, you find out what the origin is, you will then find out a list of other words that have the same origin. And in doing this, you're making connections between the words you learn, you're gaining context, and you have a partial sense of a whole bunch of other words that you may not have had any knowledge about otherwise. And this is why root words are extremely effective. And I would thoroughly recommend, right? If you're talking about memorization, you're talking about trying to learn words, right? Learning words becomes easy if you have something to relate it to. And that can only happen if you have this context. That can only happen if you have an approach to learning words. If you learn words through the roots, you get this context, right? So that's one technique. Now, what is really the final technique? Uh, just give me a second. So the last thing that you want to look at is to milk what you already know. Now you may have seen me toss these in very subtly at different points. I brought up Assassin's Creed. I brought up the game God of War. I talked about, uh, you know, the Harry Potter movies, right? All of these are things that you have consumed in your lifetime, right? You have watched movies, you have listened to music, you have watched sports, you've played games, you've done all of these things. And all of it can be useful if you actually try to find a way to use it. Right? This is a massive treasure trove for you to learn new words, right? Because one, you actually give a shit about the content. You actually care about the content. So you're more likely to make connections. You're more likely to already have context, right? You already are likely to make connections. You care about the words that you're learning, right? And 
you already have a real world motivation. You already have some real world context. So you're able to push that through, right? And ultimately, this would be a very, very effective way to learn words. I have learned so many words from video games, from rap music, and from reading books, right? Reading books, I would say, you know, okay, you know, not everyone has the time or the inclination to read a lot, but you certainly listen to music and you certainly play games of some kind or the other, right? These are opportunities for you to learn words. Actually use these opportunities because this is the one time that you give a crap. Memorizing words is hard when you don't have context. You give a crap because of the context, right? So take things that you like and maybe also find things to read about them, right? I like video games a lot. I play a lot of, uh, you know, PUBG, for example, right? I would then go and look up, well, oh, how are Battle Royale games changing the landscape of gaming altogether? Read an article about it, right? And since I actually care about that, if I find a new word there, I'm going to learn what that new word is. Now, I just want to conclude with one last thing, which is how to keep the motivation up. And I'm just going to, you know, look at what, uh, you know, some of the questions that have come up, right? Somebody says playing games isn't going to help you get into a good university. Yeah, that's true. What I, what, what I was hoping to go for is that you can gamify the process, right? So if you treat the GRE like it's a gamified process, you can actually make that kind of progress. You actually care enough to learn the words that you need to learn. Um, the next thing is that yeah, somebody says the GRE is fun. Okay, yeah, if the GRE is fun, that's awesome, right? Um, now, yes, ultimately, uh, I do see that, yeah, the link that we've sent only does have 30 words. That is true. Uh, it's meant to be more of a tester pack for you to get a sense of what these kinds of words are. Uh, I believe that you can access the entire set of flashcards on Amazon, or you can contact us directly for them. So I think Maybe if you contact us, uh, you know, our support team or you contact anyone at Crack Verbal, we'll be able to get you in touch with the right people to, you know, give you access to all of the 500 words on, the, on these flashcards, right? Uh, is there any good resource or link for a root word list? Again, you know, I would have to stress the point about not looking for a list, trying to find your own roots, right? What I would recommend is every time you see a word that you don't know, look up the origin of that word. One resource that I would say would be helpful, though it's not really a list. There's this book called Word Power Made Easy. You know what? I'm actually going to, uh, you know, straight up write this Word Power Made Easy. Now let's say Word. Oh wait, that's not particularly helpful. Let's write that uh, in a space that you actually can see me. All right. So Word Power made easy, well, not easy, easy, there we go. And it's by an author named Norman Lewis, all right? Now this book attempts to teach you vocabulary through the process of root words. I find it to be extremely effective for teaching you root words. And you know, although it's not a list, you will come across many root words as a result of going through the exercises in this book. What is particularly good about this book is that it's organized by exercises. So it's an actual set of tasks for you to do rather than the abstract process of just saying, hey, I'm going to memorize words. Right? So look up Word Power Made Easy, very easily available on Amazon. Um, you know, the, the flashcards are our own creation. This is an external creation. So you know, uh, some caveats when I recommend this, some exceptions when I recommend this, right? It's not the only resource that you should use, but very, very effective to help you learn words. And it goes through the process of teaching you words by roots. And that's why it works as well as it does. Right? Somebody has asked about the link of 30 words. Please look behind in the chat window. And I think that that's, uh, that's uh, you know, something that you want to use in order to get started on that. Uh, you've already purchased 500 frequent words. Yes, those are the, those are the words on, on, on the flashcard. So you already have access to the, you don't need access to these 30, you already have access to them as part of the 500. Now, again, right, is it enough to crack GRE? Like I said, you know, learning one word can be enough to crack the GRE, learning 500 words, maybe not enough, learning, learning 10,000 words, maybe not enough to crack the GRE. What's important is, you know, setting yourself a goal and setting yourself an understanding of what words, uh, you know, what is the focus behind the words that you need to learn, right? That's the most important thing. You have to get away from the idea that this is a mechanical process, right? 
Uh, somebody is asking about sharing the crack verbal flashcards. If you scroll up, I've already shared the link, right? If you want the uh, all of the 500 ones, then yes, of course, you know, please get in touch with somebody from the team and we will you know, help you get access to it. All right. Now, lastly, how do you keep your motivation up, right? A uh, couple of things to look out for here. One is this, you know, when you learn something, you learn it really well on day one. But what happens is that the moment you hit day two, you forget more than half of the stuff. And by the time you get to like a month later, you only remember vague snippets of this. So how do you stop that? How do you prevent yourself from forgetting all of the words that you're learning, right? A good idea is this. One day, so when you learn something, one day later, one week later, and one month later, you want to spend some time going back to that. A day later, just spend 10 minutes, right? If you spend an hour working on something, just spend 10 minutes looking at it. A week later, just spend five minutes looking at it. And a month later, just spend a couple of minutes to make sure that you remember the base idea behind that thing, right? This way, you'll ensure that you end up not forgetting information that you know you take in. Ultimately, right, if you study an hour of content, you will forget a lot of the stuff later on. So you do need to like come back to it the next day. The last thing that I want to suggest is this, right? It is essential that you gamify the process, right? It is essential that you teach yourself some technique to make this process fun, right? And here's the thing, right? Now, I, I said before, right? Why, you know, why is it better to do games or, you know, why, why might you want to like, like do something as a game? Now, games work. Games work really well at teaching people things because of a couple of reasons, right? One is this, they let you keep trying. You get to keep doing the same thing again and again. When you accomplish something, you get a sense of reward, right? So let's say you learn five words, you know, there's no pop-up that comes up in front of you telling you vocab plus two, and you know, you have improved on your vocab. It would be so nice if that were the case, right? I would like continue to learn words just for the sake of having that in, you know, having being, being told that or being told that I'm benefiting, right? So, but we don't have that in real life. So we got to replicate that. That is the element of gaming that we want to replicate in our real life to help us teach the content, to help us learn, sorry, to help us learn the content, to help us learn the words that we need to learn, right? There's a couple of ways in which you can do this. One is to look to use the words that you learn, right? When you learn these words, actually try to use them and reward yourself, feel good, you know, let yourself feel good about using them. Say, oh, look, I use this word in this situation. That's awesome, I found the context. I used the context, I came up with it, and I applied the right context all by myself. That's amazing, and, that, and you should reward yourself constantly for that, because that good feeling, that dopamine rush, is what is going to get you to come back and learn words again and again. The other technique that I recommend for gamifying the process is to actually look for other games, right? Play word games, play Scrabble, play, play, uh, play Boggle, play, you know, look for games online, right? Words with friends or whatever. It is that, uh, you know, you get access to on Facebook, right? Look for all kinds of word games and try to play around with them because that forces you to use words, that forces you to, you know, think about different ideas and what words would be associated with them. Another game that I would suggest on this front is called the Hitler game. And before you call me out on being a massive fascist, I can assure you that that is not the case. Uh, the Hitler game works like this. You go onto Wikipedia and on the today's, you know, trending topics, you click on the first link. Your job is to get from that link to the page about Hitler in as few clicks as possible. So you can only click from that link onto another link. You can't just type in Hitler anyway. You just click on that link to another link, right? So maybe today's trending topic is that there was a terrorist attack in Christchurch and in New Zealand. And uh, you know what, uh, so because, you know, because there was a terrorist attack, it may have a list of all terrorist attacks. So you could go back to terrorist attacks in the past. And that could then lead you to terrorist attacks from you know, the 1930s when Hitler came up. And that could then help lead you to Hitler. And that's just one example of doing this. But the process of doing so will force you to read a little bit more. It'll force you to come across words and it'll force you to make connections between the words and ideas that you know. So without actually actively trying to learn words, you'll become better at learning words. You know, and, and that ultimately is so, so effective because that is the way that you can get better. I would say that so much of the words that I've learned, so many of the words that I've learned, so much of the vocab building that I've done happened in the first like six years of my life. Right? And I got better after that, but so much of it happened in those first six years because of the fact that I was learning words in a way that involved playing games around them or just learning to speak and use them with the people around me. And that is ultimately the most effective manner. 
look for opportunities to learn words, look for opportunities to use the words that you learn, and look for games that you can play that will help you inadvertently learn words in the process. Right? Uh, another thing is that, you know, be look out for what we're doing as well. We are looking to change the approach by which we learn words all together. And, you know, we're looking to uh, add more content on this front. So we are go going to introduce some games. We are going to introduce some content on this. So watch this space, right? Look out for whatever we're doing on our website. And you will expect to see a few games come up, you know, over time. And that should help as well. All right, if you have any other questions, you can ask them. If not, you know, we've run well over time. So, you know, I think that we could probably close up the session over here. A webinar for RC, nice. Okay, so you know what? Um, we're starting the next quarter soon. And in that we have to decide what kinds of webinars we got to do, what kinds of webinars would be helpful. I'm definitely going to keep this as a suggestion. I think that that's it's probably going to be a good idea down the line to do a webinar on reading comprehension. I think, you know, you could probably expect to see one in the coming couple of months or so. Anything else? All right. So that if that's it, you know, we can close this session up. Thank you all for taking time on this evening, right? I know that, you know, it's the evening, you want to enjoy yourself, you want to chill out. Uh, but, you know, thanks a lot for, uh, you know, taking some time out. Somebody has also asked about a webinar for text completion. That would be pretty interesting. I think that sentence equivalence and text completion are very similar to each other. Uh, we could probably do a webinar on both of them or the technique that you might need to use for both of them. That could be very helpful. How can I get the flashcards? from the webinar. If you scroll up, you can see the link that, 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 that I've posted, right? It's, it's in the chat window already. So just access that link and you should be good to go. All right, if not, I'm gonna go back to the page, right? I'm only gonna keep this up for a few seconds so that you can take a screenshot, right? Go ahead and take your screenshot. And uh, I have run well over time. I have another student to teach, so I'm going to sign off. Thank you all so much. Take care and have a wonderful night. Thanks.